Well, welcome back. This is Cherry again, and we're going to get started with session one of your EMT transition module. This thing never responds like it should. Just a second here. Okay. First thing we're going to talk about, and one of the elements on the transition application that we talked about earlier, was the pediatric assessment triangle. Now, I've obviously been an EMT for a while. I've taught quite a number of EMT classes, and I was not introduced to this until I took a class as a paramedic. I think it's one of the coolest tools around for pediatric assessments. Now, if you've been an EMT for a while, I think you would agree with me that we don't ever get enough pediatric education and thankfully, we don't get enough pediatric patients to get really good at this. So this pediatric assessment triangle, I think, is going to provide you with a very cool way to make that initial gut level assessment that tells you, wow, this kid is sick, we need to get scooting, or uh, maybe we're OK here. So let's talk about this in triangle. What is involved in it, and then we'll apply it to some different situations. So the first part of the triangle is A for appearance. Now this is going to be done from the doorway. As you know, with pediatrics, we don't ever come charging up on them and try and get up close and personal right away for a couple different reasons. Number one, they're terrified of us. Um, they want mom. They don't want anybody else around. Probably a good chance mom's going to be a little anxious and concerned, or she wouldn't have called the ambulance to begin with. And, you know, this is to hold the kids' feet off of that by having strangers in the house, and now they want to come touch and feel, and they look funny, and they've got stuff they want to put on them and in them. So we're going to do all this from the door before we bust into that normal situation or as close to normal as we're going to get. And look at this kid. So things we're going to look for. Um, obviously, we're going to look at the environment very quickly and kind of see how this kid is. We're going to look and see how is this child interacting with his surroundings? Is he responding appropriately? You know, a, a three-year-old should not be just listless, hanging out, really don't care what's going on. Uh, typically, children should not be afraid of their parents. They should um, you know, be interacting with mom and dad. So look at their appearance. This is also going to include positioning. How is that four-year-old sitting? Are we seeing some tripod positioning there? Are we seeing some that chin being jutted out in an effort to breathe? Um, are we seeing a very listless, lethargic child? Is the patient sitting on mom's lap giggling and laughing until we walk in? Um, how, how is that going on? Um, we're going to look at some things like um, interaction. We're going to look at eyes. We're going to look at muscle movement. Are there tremors? Are they stiff? Are they floppy? That, that whole in general appearance, but we're going to just do that quick quick once over from the door on that. Okay. Second element is work of breathing. Now, no child or adult for that matter, but especially children, should have to work at breathing. We don't think about it. It's a normal thing. It should happen automatically without thought. So if any patient is working to breathe, this is a problem, and we need to be addressing that. So. Looking at appearance, if we find any red flags with appearance, that's a concern. If we have a child that's working to breathe, that's a concern. Some of the things with breathing that we see, and I know you guys got this in your initial education, um, is accessory muscle use. Is that child using accessory muscles, like intercostal muscles in the ribs? Um, do we have that sub clavian or that, um, you know, when they breathe in and, and the hollow points in their neck suck way in. Uh, do we see nasal flaring? 
do they have their chin jutted out? Are they, are they holding themselves up trying to get more air in? With children, another thing we can look at is are they grunting with each breath? Sometimes that grunting, uh, not sometimes, almost always that grunting indicates to us that they're giving that last little uh, trying to breathe in or breathe out. So grunting is also a sign of work of breathing. Um, the other thing with kids that we can look at is belly breathing. Now for some kids that's normal at some ages, but belly breathing when they're using those abdominal muscles to assist their breathing is an issue. Now my kind of just general school of thought is if they're belly breathing, they're working fairly hard. If they're using accessory muscles, they're working a little harder. If you've got those clavicle or subclavian retractions up in the neck, they're working really hard. And if you combine any of those with nasal flaring, this kiddo is working really hard. So the higher up the muscle use, the harder they're working. Um, you know, we talk a lot about intercostal muscle use, but you're not going to be able to see that across the room. You're not going to be able to see it, obviously, with a t-shirt on, and you're probably never going to see it unless you're looking for it. So look at those kids. Um, the closer you get, keep looking to see if you've got that work of breathing, because we all know that respiratory issues are one of the number one things that cause kids for sure to go into cardiac arrest, but to go downhill. So we want to make sure that we're looking closely for that work of breathing. And the third thing is circulation. Now, to assess their circulation from the room, we're basically going to look at skin color and are they bleeding. So skin color, as you know from your initial education, comes in several different flavors. Okay, they can be pink, pink, warm, and dry, which we hope they are. Um, they can also be pale, which tells us that uh, they're kind of shocky. They're not getting the circulation to their skin that they should for whatever reason. Cyanosis, that bluish, grayish color, tells us that they're hypoxic. They're not getting enough oxygen. The jaundice yellow color skin tells us that they're having some sort of liver problems and they're having some toxic situation based on that. So we want to look at are they, do they have good skin color and are they bleeding? Yeah, how long is it going to take us from the door to do that? Uh, look at the appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. So basically this is our new ABCs. Um, that can be done from the door just very, very quickly. We're going to practice that. Okay, we're going to use these kiddos. So let's look at this guy right here. And we're going to use the basic acronym sick or not sick. So based on how this little guy is sitting, um, we'll take a look at that, that A. Okay. Now, based on the things that we can see from this child, I'm guessing he's, and this is just purely a guess, uh, five, six, seven months old. Most five, six, seven months old don't just hang there. You can see there's a hand behind his neck holding up his head. They should be holding up their own head at this point probably should be sitting up at this point on their own. This child is not. Based on the fact that we see limb leads on his legs um, and on his shoulders, he's in a situation that probably is not very familiar or comfortable to him. Um, and clear up at the top, you can see where they're maybe administering an, a breathing treatment to this child. So his whole appearance we would expect this child to be afraid, crying, clinging to mom, uh, or something in this environment, and he is not. So he's not positioned like he should be. He's not reacting to his surroundings like he should be. So there are some definite red flags with his appearance. Looking at the breathing, look up at his nostrils. Can you see the very obvious nasal flaring? You can also see that he's got his mouth open. Um, and then looking at his chest, you see that sunken portion in the middle there. Now, obviously, we can't see him breathing, but it looks like he may certainly be having some belly breathing or intercostal muscle use there as well. And so this child is maybe working to breathe. As far as skin color, he's not looking terrible bad 
and I, I know these pictures aren't the best as far as color, but of our ABCs, our parents work of breathing and circulation, two of them have red flags. So I think we can probably very safely say this is a sick child. Let's look at this guy. Obviously a little older. Um, and you know, in my classes when I do this face to face, sometimes I get, well, you know, he looks okay. But if you look close, um, look at his eyes. This is the thing that stands out to me. Look at his eyes. Those eyes to me are telling me, help me. Or, or there's fear or concern in his eyes. He's looking at you, looking for some reassurance. Um, you can also see that um, he's kind of got his chin jetted out. He's, he's sitting upright. And the color is good. But his positioning and possibly, if you look at um, in the middle of his chest there, right, uh, right in here, Maybe some work of breathing going on there. Maybe some in here. Uh, so this possible uh, child is possibly very sick based on, on those things, although his skin color looks fairly good. Okay. We look at this one, and I know this is a little hard to see, but um, now this child, would you say, is reacting normal in this situation? I mean, this guy is trying to touch her, and she is screaming and fighting and having absolutely nothing to do with him, which I would think would be normal. That's what I would want to see from a child. I'd be much more concerned if she was just laying there uh, without any concern at all. Um, obviously, we can't see her work of breathing, but if she's got enough breath in her to be screaming, that's a good sign. And her skin color looks fine. So I'm not so sure that child's not, not sick at all. And then we'll look at this last one. And if it takes you any time at all to get that, oh my gosh, this child is sick, we need to go back and start over. Um, if you look at the ABCs on this child, there's nothing really that you can see that's good. As far as appearance, this child is lethargic, limp, flaccid. You can see from the arm hanging there that uh, probably has IVs in that arm. That's why they're on the board. Got a monitor hooked up. You know, we don't routinely hook up cardiac monitors on kids unless they're pretty darn sick. Um, you can see that uh, with the eyes, very um, tuned out, I guess would be a good word. Not, not paying attention to his surroundings at all and just flat too sick to care. With work of breathing, you can see the middle of the chest. There's some retractions there. Uh, they're obviously giving a nebulized treatment. But then if you look at the skin color of this child, although the picture's not great, you can definitely see that this kid is not pink. And this is a sick, sick kid. And walking in on a situation like this, uh, I would, I would be very, very concerned. One of the things we know about kids, they compensate. They compensate very well, and they compensate for a very long time. And when they're done, they're done. They work as hard as they can, as long as they can, and then they quit. And their breathing quits, their heart quits, everything quits. So this child, I think, is not very too far from being from that. Gosh, I can't talk. Not too far from being at that point. So definitely a sick kid. Now, based on this, it really doesn't take long to do that quick ABC. Um, the first three are the top two, and um, this little sick guy on the bottom, I think these are probably, uh, let's, let's get them going and treat them in a row. That little one down there with the uh, EMT in presence, maybe we can hang out a little bit and see what we're going to do with her. Okay. So, I really like this part. I like giving you the opportunity to be able to apply what we've learned. So let's look at these patients, okay? Let's look at this one. Ten-year-old boy. He's got a fever. He's less responsive. He's got a respiratory rate of 60. His airway is patent. He's got some belly breathing going on. 
and you can't get an O2 sat on him. His heart rate is 160. He's got pink skin, but he's marbled centrally. His hands and feet are blue, and it's very hard to feel a radial pulse on him. On the APU scale, his eyes are open, but he does not make eye contact. He does not vocalize anything, and he moves his extremities sporadically. Based on what you know, even though you can't see this child, would you say he is sick or not sick? And this would actually be nicer if we could have some conversation there. But if you just take a few minutes and look at that, or a few seconds and look at that, and say, holy cow, respiratory rate of 60. Is that something I should be concerned about? I can't get a sat. Is that something I should be concerned about? And then a heart rate of 160. He's 10. Is that normal? Is it high? Is it acceptable? He's got pink skin, but he's marbled centrally, and his hands and feet are blue. I don't know where you come from, but generally blue skin is not good. Okay, and he's got a radial pulse that's hard to palpate. That could tell me a lot of things, but none of them are really good. Okay. Now consider again, this kid's 10. His eyes are open, but he's not making eye contact with you. That's not normal. He's not talking. Now, it doesn't say whether it's a girl or a boy, but most of them should talk, and this guy, is, this child is not. And then moving extremities sporadically. Generally at 10, you're making very purposeful movements. So that is something to be concerned about. Again, those vitals, it's so hard to know what's normal for a 10-year-old. So there's definitely, I would think, some red flags there. Let's look at this next patient. This is a two-week-old. This child has a fever and is less responsive. This child has a respiratory rate of 60, patent airway, some belly breathing going on, and we're unable to obtain SATs on this child. This child has a heart rate of 160, pink skin, but marbled centrally, hands and feet are blue, Radio pulse is hard to palpate. Is this kind of sounding familiar? Okay. And then again, eyes are open. This child's not making eye contact, not vocalizing anything, and moves extremities sporadically. Sounds an awful lot like our 10-year-old. Okay, now let's look at our 10-year-old. Respiratory rate of 60, is that high? Yes, that is high. Normal respiratory rate for a 10-year-old. Uh, should be in that 25 to 35 range, 20 to 25 range. So 60 is very high. Okay. Belly breathing, is that normal? No. Should you be able to get a set on the 10-year-old? Yes. Okay. And a heart rate of 160, is that high? Yes. Um, skin color we talked about is an issue. So let's go back to the two-week-old. Respiratory rate of 60. Peyton airway, belly breathing, can't get sats, can't get a radial pulse. Again, blue hands, blue feet. Moving extremities sporadically. Is this kid sick? Let's break it down. Okay. Hardest part about pediatrics is knowing what normal is. Because pediatrics include everything from one minute old and in some cases, 21 years of age, or at least 18. That's a wide range, and they do a lot of changing in that period of time. So respiratory rate of 60 for this two-week-old. You know, there's nothing in this two-week-old that's different from the 10-year-old. Blue hands, blue feet, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, can't get sats. This kid is sick. I think. Let's break it down. Respiratory rate of 60 for a two-week-old, is that normal? The answer to that is yes. Maybe on the little bit high side, but nothing to get your panties in a lot about. Okay. This child is belly breathing. 
Is that normal? Yes. For a two-week-old, it is. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to get sats on a two-week-old or a two-month-old, but I'm here to tell you that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So does that necessarily mean anything that you're unable to get sats? It may just mean you don't have the right equipment. It may mean that this child's moving around. It just may mean a lot of things rather than they're so low we can't pick them up. Whereas the 10-year-old, we should be picking that up. How about a heart rate of 160 for a two-week-old? Is that fast? A little on the high side, but nothing, nothing to be concerned about. Pink skin, that's good. Marble centrally. Now, how many of you out there are saying, oh, marble centrally, blue hands and blue feet. Don't care who you are, that's bad. If you've ever given a tiny baby a bath, you take their clothes off, you give them a bath, they get marbled and their hands and feet turn blue because they get cold very quickly. Now, if you're looking at their trunk, their central part of their body, you've got their clothes on. They very well are probably cold. Um, hands and feet turn blue very quickly on, on babies. They also pink right back up. So maybe not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Now how about this? The radio pulse is hard to palpate. There's a reason we palpate brachial pulses on babies, and that's it. The radio pulse is hard to palpate. So that's not necessarily a red flag. Okay. How about the av poop? This baby's eyes are open, but he's not making eye contact. He's not talking to us, and he moves his extremities sporadically. Nothing in there abnormal for a two-week-old. But when we apply that to a 10-year-old, it's a big deal. So. My point in this exercise is we need to know what normal is. And never are we going to be able to be 100% sure when we take care of kids so infrequently. So find some tools and use them. There's a very cool, uh, it's a chart. It comes in a circle. It's called the PD wheel. I think it runs like 25 bucks or something to buy it. But you can dial into a patient's age or weight, and it will give you the normal vital signs for that child so you kind of know what's normal. Because it's very, very hard to know what's abnormal if you don't even know what normal is. There's other more expensive tools out there. Um, there's the... Roslo tape, which is an excellent tool, but it's very expensive. Um, how about if you just pulled up a chart, maybe something off of a website, maybe something out of a textbook, and you printed it out and you laminated it and hung it in your squad, or you threw it in your PD bag, or you put it in your flip chart uh, for that field guide that you carry with you all the time, so you've got that to recognize. Rather yet, look in your field guide. There's an excellent section in most of those for pediatric assessments. It gives you a great tool. Those tools are available to you. And if you think that it makes you look inadequate or like you're not smart enough to remember that, you're wrong. Because referring to those charts when you're dealing with a pediatric patient makes you a very smart versus a medical provider. So find you a tool, make it available to yourself, and use it. Okay. So let's look here. Here's our steps in our pediatric assessment. Okay. Pre-arrival preparation. When that tone goes out, our squad 51, you're paced out to a three-year-old short of breath. What can we do at that point to get ready for this call? Besides getting the squad and drive really fast. Okay. Start thinking. Okay, I'm doing three-year-old. Three-year-old short of breath. A couple of things you need to be going through your head. What is normal for a three-year-old? And number two, start throwing some ideas in a box. What could cause a three-year-old to be short of breath? So that when you get there, you can start ruling stuff out. Okay. 
Could it be a bee sting? Could it be anaphylaxis? Could it be that he's choking? Could it be that he has pneumonia? Could it be that he has croup? Could it be that he's got an anaphylactic reaction going? Uh, could it be that mom's just really worked up and, and upset? Could it be that you know, he's been suffocated? Could it be a thousand different things? Start, start running those through your mind and have them in your box so that you can say, you know what? He's not choking, he's moving air, so we're going to throw that one out. Um, he's, he's not allergic to anything. There's no swelling in his tongue, his lips, his throat. We're going to throw it out of and start ruling that down. But um, if you don't know what normal is, you're going to have a hard time knowing how sick this kid is. So on your way, grab your tool, wherever that tool is. If it's the, the printout in your squad, if it's the field guide that you carry in your pocket, if it's the PD wheel that's uh, on the dash of the squad, whatever it is, drag it out and take a look at it. Next thing is seeing size up. This is important for us, you know, to make sure that we're safe, of course. It's also very, very important for our children patients uh, because, as you all know, we may be that one link to safety for them. And being mandatory reporters, we need to kind of keep our eyes open because uh, there's not usually signs in the front yard that says, you know, child abuse or dangerous situation for children. Uh, we have to find that. And if we miss that, we may be the one person that could have done something for that child. So look at your scene size up. Make sure you're safe. Make sure that uh, this looks like a safe place for a child to be. And you're going to go in from the doorway, do that pediatric assessment triangle. Stop, pause, very quickly make that boom, boom, boom decision. Uh, appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. Take a quick look at those. Then we'll move on into the child and go over our initial assessments. Now remembering with our children, we're going to start at the feet. Okay, so we're going to touch the feet and get the skin temperature there check for pulses, see if the baby's reacting or the child is reacting, and then move up to the head so we're less threatening to that child. We want to get those ABCs, um, and then if we need to you know, find out their disabilities and expose them if, we, if there's a need. And then make that decision. Are we staying in plan or are we going? Now that decision may be made with your PAT. If you've got a sick, sick kid, it may not take any vital signs for you to say, uh, let's let's load and get going and we're gonna we're gonna do some of the important stuff in the rig. Okay? And then uh, do the additional assessments, the focused history, the physical exam, all of that good stuff. And now ongoing assessment so we can trend how this child is doing. One thing we want to catch is if this child is deteriorating, we need to let that information be passed on to the receiving facility so they can prepare for this kid. They're quite honestly, unless you're going to a children's hospital, no better take at taking care of pediatrics than we are because we just don't see that many sick kids. So um, let them know what's going on with that ongoing assessment. All right, let's look at this. You've been called out to a three-year-old with approximately a 20-foot fall from construction scaffolding. Now, take a moment and just identify to yourself a couple of things. Number one, what is your pucker factor when the call like this comes into you? Um, number two, what are you expecting to find when you get there? And number three, what is normal for a three-year-old? Okay. I often have students that say, what the heck is a three-year-old doing on 20-foot scaffolding? Um, and immediately that question comes to mind is, is this story really true? So that's a good thing to have in the back of your mind. You know, is this child safe where he's at? But at the very most, we We've got some serious mechanism of injury here. 20 foot fall for a three-year-old is a very significant height. And 
one thing that we may be looking at is um, obviously we're going to have that blood force trauma, broken bones, um, possibly contusions, damage to internal organs, but very specifically to the head. Three-year-old has a ginormous head compared to his body, and it's very heavy. So when this child starts to fall at 20 feet, more than likely this child's going to land on his head. So we're probably looking at at least some head injuries going on here. Okay, so you pull up to the suburban house. It's under construction. Dad's out front. He frantically takes you back to the back. And there's a small child sobbing in mother's arms. Good or bad? Well, mom picked him up, so that's a little concern with C-spine. But the fact that he's sobbing is a very good thing. He's breathing. So we know from the get-go, okay, our PAT. So parents, dad tells you up there's a platform when she fell onto a concrete pad. Okay, so appearance, he's in mom's arms. He's crying. That's reacting in a good, positive way. That's probably how he should be reacting. Um, he's breathing. He's got enough air to be sobbing. That's good. And you don't notice any active bleeding. So let's look at his PAT. Um, he's alert. When you go up to him, he makes eye contact, and he sits up and tells you to go away. And I'm pretty good with that. That's, a, that's exactly what I'd like him to say. Okay? You don't notice any retractions. You don't notice any nasal flaring or any grunting with his breathing. And obviously, he's got enough air in there to holler, so that's a good thing. And his skin is nice and pink. Okay? So based on this, is this child seriously hurt or not so much? Now, going back to pre-arrival, we found out what's normal for a three-year-old. Okay, a couple other things that we did. Um, on this call, when you get paged out to this, is there anything you would do in route? Um, you're going to ask for additional assistance. And what I get most of the time is, put a helicopter in route. By all means, a helicopter ride is not a bad thing. Now, obviously, that's going to depend on where you are and where you're transporting to. And that brings us to the second question. Where would you take this child if you were transporting him? Okay. So based on this, PAT really doesn't show anything significant. Okay. If we had a helicopter around, are you going to keep them coming or are you going to turn them around? If you were thinking about transporting to Children's Hospital, or to a level one trauma center. What do you think? I mean, level four trauma center. Um, are we going to continue with that? I would say this child is stable. But based on our mechanism of injury, I think there's still a great potential for some serious internal injuries. So. I, myself, would keep that helicopter en route because my mechanism of injury hasn't changed. And give this child a very good chance of surviving this and doing well. All right, so let's look at our kiddo. He's got a patent airway. He is not going to let you put that C collar on no matter what. He's got a respiratory rate of 48. He's crying good and loud. He's got good air entry. Um, you put your pulse socks on, but it's not picking anything up. Baby's got a heart, or baby child's got a heart rate of 160. His capillary refill is less than two seconds. He's got a nice strong radial pulse. And somehow you got a blood pressure of 110 over 80. Okay. He's kicking, he's screaming, he's thrashing around. You do notice on uh, examination he's got an obvious deformity on his left forearm. The skin's intact. And then the only other thing you find is a superficial abrasion on his left temple. Okay. 
63, so respiratory rate of 48. I'm not too concerned about that. He's crying. Okay. He's also yelling and screaming and thrashing, so that's probably why you're not getting a pulse ox on him. Okay. He's got a heart rate of 160. You know, the poor kid just fell 20 feet off a of scaffold, and he's probably scared. So 160 is not that big a deal. Um, the cap refill is good. And that's also a very excellent tool to use on kids. You can't get a full ox, do a quick cap refill. It's quick, it's fast, it's easy, and it's very accurate. Not so accurate on our older folk, but it's good on kids. And then that good, strong rate of pulse tells us that um, we've got pretty good blood pressure and circulation. And when you take the blood pressure, it's 110 over 80. Heck, fire, that'd be good for me. Okay. So um, other than the deformity to his left forearm, which is a long way from being fatal, uh, not a whole lot going on here. What do you think? Keep the helicopter en route? Still going to Children's? I think I would, because we still have that mechanism of injury. Okay, so load and go. Are you going to immobilize that spine? Are you going to put the C collar on him? Um, and how are we going to get him? Are we going to put him on a long spine board? One thing that I found to be very, very cool with kids, especially about this age, is using a KED. I mean, we don't use them for much of anything else. Think back when the last time you actually got yours out to put it on a patient. Um, but laying your child you know, with the C-collar and the KED, and then wrapping those uh, sides around him really does a couple things. It keeps them very immobilized, uh, secures their arms down, but it also gives them a sense of security. They're being wrapped tightly, so kind of that papoose syndrome going on there. Does this kid need ALS? Or is BLS enough? I mean, what's ALS going to do for this kid? Well, that's a decision that you're going to have to make. Now, honestly, as an ALS provider, what I'm going to do for this kiddo is monitor him very, very closely and start an IV. Is the IV going to save his life? No, probably not. Um, it just gives me a route. If things really go south in a hurry, I've got a means to get medication into him. But my best tool is going to be that very close monitoring and continuous reassessment. And can you do that as a BLS? Absolutely. Do you still want ALS there? Uh, by heck, I would. Um, if I was ALS, I'd want another ALS person there in case this kid goes south. Um, nobody wants to be there by themselves. Okay. So we're going to take him to a trauma center, or let's say instead of a community hospital, I mean, that's a pretty easy decision to make, but let's say trauma center versus Children's Hospital, which one would you go to? Now, if you've decided to fly him, that decision probably will be made by the flight crew. But let's say you have to make that decision because you're going by ground because it's uh, raining outside. Um, and that's something that you need to check out. You know, first question is, does the pediatric hospital have a trauma team? If they don't, then let's go to the trauma center, get them stabilized, and then move them on to the pediatrics. If they've got a trauma team there, then that's the best place for it. Whoops, I'm sorry. Okay, so you get visit with mom on the way there. She goes with you. Um, basically, his only complaint is that left arm pain. Mom tells you he has no allergies. She said he's had a cold, so she's been giving him a little bit of cold medicine. Um, he had an ear infection not too long ago with this cold. He had a burger and fries about 45 minutes ago. Uh, the family was meeting with the contractor at their new home site. The child was unobserved while they were visiting for about five minutes. The parents witnessed the fall. They report to you that the child cried immediately with no loss of consciousness. Does that sound like a viable story to you? Well, if you've ever had a three-year-old little child, particularly a boy, you know in five minutes they could almost scale the Empire State Building. So um, 
you're going to have to look at that, but you know, that is a plausible story, and you do find in this situation that um, it seems to match up, and all the parties there agree that that is what happened. So, oh my goodness, I keep going backwards. Um, we're going to do a complete physical exam and route, monitor, and note any responses to treatment. In route, you did call ALS. They started an IV and gave a little bolus of fluid. While he was in the ER, he became sleepy. And the doctor there ordered a head and abdominal CT. Found out he did have the right parietal skull fracture. Uh, and that's where that little abrasion came from that we saw on his temple. He had a liver laceration and an elbow fracture. Now, could this child have died in your care? Skull fracture, he could have uh, had brain swelling and increased pressure in his skull, which could have been detrimental. Liver laceration could have caused him to bleed out uh, very quickly. And the elbow fracture, although that was the biggest complaint that he had, actually was the least of his worries. Luckily, though, because you were crackpot EMTs, I mean crack shot, I mean really good EMTs, <laughs> Um, got in there quickly. He was admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit and was home after five days. Very good. Okay. So, you know, we can never get enough practice at doing pediatric care. And again, I tell you, these, these babies and these kids um, compensate so well. And then when they, when they crump, they crump. I will tell you just a personal story here. Um, I had heard that. I don't know how many times. I've even taught that to several EMT classes that, you know, pediatric patients um, compensate and then they, they go downhill very quickly. Um, in my head, I knew that. I never actually seen it happen. Um, as drastically, or as, as caught me as off guard, as my son. He actually was 16 years old, had been in Japan for two years, and flew home. But when he got home, he kind of laid around, was tired, and, you know, told me he was having a hard time sleeping at night. He was tired all the day, and I just assumed he had some jet lag. I mean, good Lord, he just flew halfway around the world. So I wasn't terribly concerned. Um, until football practice started. And I don't know how much you know about Iowa football, but we lived in an area where Jake went to school in Harlan. And in Harlan, Iowa, football is, is the reason to exist. And so when Jake did not go to the first football practice, I knew he was very near dead. Um, he just said he didn't feel good. I kept looking and monitoring, and I honestly could find nothing wrong with him. Though I know he wasn't drinking like he should, so I, being a good mom, uh, got some IV fluids and, and uh, was going to give him some IV fluids at home and get him rehydrated and try and help him get a little better. Um, I did that, and I also drew some blood and was going to take it up to the lab because I thought maybe he had mono, and that was what was making him tired. Well, that night, he got sick. He started throwing up. He started running a high temperature. So the next morning, um, after sleeping on the floor next to him all night, I ran the labs up to the hospital. He was sleeping well by that point. Had them run the tests, and they came back negative for mono, but his white cell count was increased, was up. Well, when I... Looked at him that morning, he was breathing fast, about 60 times a minute, but he wasn't working to breathe. When I asked him if it was hard to breathe, he said no. When I asked him why he was breathing so fast, he said he didn't know. Um, and I listened to his lung sounds, and they were clear. He was moving good air in his lungs. So I took his lab results over to the doctor and told the doctor what was going on, and Based on the fact that his respiratory rate was increased, he said, you know, let's, let's get a check x-ray just to make sure. Well, to make this long story short, Jake's chest x-ray um, 
turned out to be pretty monumental. <coughs> and he had three types of pneumonia in each lung. He went from being kind of not feeling well to a candidate for being put on the ventilator. He had been given six types of antibiotics, had been admitted to the hospital, and the respiratory therapist came to me and said, Cherry, this, this child is scaring me. I don't want to take care of him anymore, and I think we need to fly him out of here. And that scared me. Um, I watched my very healthy 16-year-old boy lose 32 pounds in 10 days, shrivel up to nothing, and not have the ambition to go to the bathroom on his own power. Um, we darn near lost that boy, and the only indication I had that he was sick was his respiratory rate. And I'll be real honest with you, I didn't recognize that as being significant as it was. So your pediatric kids will um, catch you off guard. And um, and I, I took that to heart. I learned a lesson the hard way. Luckily, he was fine, but it was scary for a few days. All right, let's do one more. Uh, in this case, you're called to a 26-month-old boy who has severe pain in both legs. When you get there, he's lying on the couch. He's clutching his teddy bear and crying uncontrollably. His father tells you that his son has sickle cell disease, and this pain began about two hours ago. So again, we want to go back to that PAT. Um, how, how is he appearing? Okay, he's lying on the couch, he's clutching his teddy bear, and he is crying. Is that normal? Okay, he's, he's two years old. Uh, Dad tells you he has sickle cell disease. So my concern is, is that just an excuse? Uh, did Dad do something to him, and he's just telling you this to make an excuse for the pain? Um, and why did it take Dad two hours to call if indeed this child has been this sick for this long? So doing your PAT quick, uh, the child is alert, he's agitated, and he's crying. Um, the child is mildly technictic, meaning he's breathing a little bit fast. But he's not working to breathe. He's not using accessory muscles or belly breathing or grunting, nasal flaring, anything of that sort. Uh, he is very pale. He's got pale lips, and his mucous membranes are pale. Okay, so. Of those three things, really we've got a small little flag that is breathing fast, and he's got pale skin. So let's err on the side of caution and say this kid is sick, shall we? Okay. Really, he's pale. Um, but we're going to look at pain, and we're going to call that a fifth vital sign. Okay. What we found is that people in pain do not heal well. They don't do well. And if we can get rid of the pain, we have much more positive outcomes as far as healing, getting over things, being able to uh, build up your immune system, being able to build up your uh, strength and, and, and recover from things. So this kid has severe pain. And we need to look at that as something significant. So let's continue our assessment and see if we can find the cause of that pain. So looking at his um, ABCs, he's got a patent airway. He's got a respiratory rate of 30. Now he's two, so that's not too abnormal. His lungs are clear, that's good. And you're getting a sat of 97%. Not bad. He's got a heart rate of 130. Just a little fast, but he's crying and hurting, so that's probably to be expected. He's got strong peripheral pulses, so his, his radio pulses are good. But he's got pale nails and pale lips and a blood pressure of 100 over 66. Now let's talk about blood pressures. As a general rule of thumb, if you take the patient's age, multiply it times 2, and add it to 70, that's the lowest systolic, or the top number, that we would like to see in the child and be acceptable. So this gets 2. So 2 times 2 is 4 plus 70. 
So 74 would be the lowest systolic pressure we would find acceptable. His is 100. So he's got a good blood pressure. That's very acceptable. Okay. Um, he's alert. He responds to questions. You don't see any bruising. You don't see any deformities. Um, you don't see swelling. But every time you touch either of his legs, very, very tender to touch. Okay. Why both legs? That's my question. Why both legs? So what else do you want to know from this? I want to know what happened. I want to know maybe a little more about that sickle cell thing, too. Okay. So let's see here. That tells you when you asked if his sickle cell disease was diagnosed by newborn screening. And his first crisis was dactylitis when he was eight months old. A couple things here. Wonder if we normally screen newborns for sickle cell disease. Number two, what the heck is dactylitis? Well, if you look at the itis, itis always means inflammation out. Okay? And dactyl is a digit or tubal um, tubal-shaped, tubular-shaped um, elements. So uh, he had dactylitis, um, can typically be a finger, toe, arm, something that had inflammation in it. Okay. He's had two prior vaso-occlusive crises, and both of them required hospital admission. Now that has got my interest peaked. It was bad enough that they actually admitted him to the hospital. There was there's some validity to this. Okay. Now he's on prophylactic penicillin twice daily. Interesting. When was the last time you had a patient that took penicillin prophylactically to prevent something? Okay. But Dad tells me there was no fever preceding this illness. Okay, his normal hemoglobin is 8.5 uh, grams per deciliter. And Dad tells you he always looks pale. Now, as an EMT, do we have a clue if 8.5 is good, bad, or otherwise? No. But does Dad? Yes. Dad knows what normal is. And he also tells you this is always low. But that's about normal for him, but it is low. Now, check this out. Dad gave oxycodone 30 minutes ago with no relief. Now, if you know what oxycodone is, this causes some concern. Oxycodone is a very, very strong narcotic painkiller. Um, typically, we find patients that are on hospice care um, or have terminal illnesses take oxycodone or patients that have uh, severe musculoskeletal issues that can find relief no other way to take oxycodone. So my question to this dad would be, number one, where'd you get the oxycodone? Number two, was it the child's? And number three, if he gave him that powerful of a drug and got no relief, this pain is worse than I thought. So, we know a little more about this, but sometimes knowing more causes more questions. So, I have a lot of questions here that I'd like to know. Okay. Um, what's your overall assessment of this kiddo? Okay. What are your management priorities? What are you going to do for him? Can't touch his legs, he screams, he hurts. Um, is he sick or not sick? And how are we going to transport him? BLS, ALS, transporting sitting up, sitting down. How are we going to get him on the cot? Is dad going to come with us? Are we going to take him to children's? Are we going to take him to a trauma center? Where are we going with this kiddo? Okay, so let's look at sickle cell disease and talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, sickle cell disease is typically found in African-American people, 
typically males. And sometimes in the Middle Eastern ethnicities, uh, with the very, the very dark-skinned, like um, Asian, Arabic, those type of, of ethnicities. Um, and sickle cell disease simply means that the red blood cells, which are normally donut-shaped, um, not completely, kind of a disc with a hollowed out spot in the middle that carries our oxygen molecules. So the red blood cells have a coating on them or have a hemoglobin on them that the oxygen can stick to them, and that's what transports the oxygen to the cells in our body. Well, in a child with sickle cell disease, instead of those red blood cells being round and disc-shaped, they're shaped like a, um, oh heavens, a sickle, I guess that's where you get the name, that you would chop weeds with, or a boomerang, that kind of angled, oblong shape. And sometimes those red blood cells get caught and log jammed in a vessel. And that causes severe pain when that happens. We don't really know why it is, and there's really not a whole lot we can do except giving them some fluids and pain management to get through that. But when the red blood cells are shaped like that, they don't carry oxygen very well. So very frequently we find these children, are, or these people in general, are anemic. Um, and when they become severely anemic, they get that pale skin because they're not getting oxygen to the cells that need it. So they're, they're pale. There's no fever when anemia is the problem. They have a very normal mental status and they have strong peripheral pulses because their blood pressure is good. Their heart is going to be beating enough to try and push those blood cells that aren't working very well around faster to try and get oxygen to the cells. So it's a means of compensation for these, these patients. Their, their heart rate's going to go up and their blood pressure is going to go up to try and get more oxygen to the cells that need it. Now, sometimes these patients become septic, which means there's an infection going on. Um, they, they don't have the capability of fighting off infection like the rest of us do. So they get uh, infections much easier and they're much more detrimental because as you, as you know, an infection is kind of like a furnace burning in your body. And when a furnace burns, it requires two things. It requires fuel and it requires oxygen to continue to burn. So when we have an infection going on in our body, it's going to require fuel to do that, which is going to be sugar in this case. And it's also going to require oxygen. Well, when these kids don't have enough oxygen to begin with, and they get an infection, sepsis uh, can take them down pretty quickly. Now, the thing that you're going to see with a, with a septic sickle cell disease patient is they'll have an altered mental status because their demand for oxygen has gone up, but their ability to deliver it has not. And so the brain is going to become low on oxygen. So they're going to get that altered mental status. They will have the fever that accompanies the infection. And their pulse um, may not always be strong. So when you're assessing someone that you know has sickle cell disease, keep this in mind. Now the big, the big thing here that you're going to be seeing that's easy to tell is the fever. If there's a fever, they're probably septic. If there is not a fever, let's look a little more towards anemia. And then look at that mental status. Okay. So with sickle cell disease, pain episodes can occur at any part of the body at any given time. There's no, no way to predict that. Um, we talked about that log jamming effect for whatever reason. So the pain management and fluids are the thing that's going to help them get through. Therefore, if you as an EMT are treating this patient, it probably would be advantageous to get ALS on scene because there are some things they can do 
to assist with the recovery process in this. It's usually a self-limited course, but the pain is very, very intense when it happens. Okay. So patients with sickle cell disease, regardless of age, are at risk for serious infections like we talked about. They just don't have the ability to fight off those infections. So some of those serious infections can be pneumonia, uh, bacterema, that's a bacteria infection, meningitis, as we all know that's very significant, osteomyelitis, um, and then septic arthritis, which is a little bit interesting. Um, you just don't picture, especially kids, having arthritis and then to think that it could be an arthritis with infection that could be fatal if it goes untreated is, is kind of a whole new ball game. So um, arthritis in these kids, um, they're vulnerable to infection, especially to encapsulated bacteria, like salmonella is one they're very susceptible to, and the other one is pneumococcus. And that pneumococcus bacteria is the type of pneumonia that kills people. So that's very, very, even healthy people die from that type of pneumonia. So I always think if you've got a febrile patient or a patient with a fever and they have sickle cell disease, um, we're going to consider that they have a serious bacterial infection until proven otherwise. So you need to gown up, not gown up, BSI up, make sure that you have gloves on, make sure that you potentially have a mask on, make sure that you protect yourself against all body fluids, um, and make sure that you pass on that information when you hand the patient over when you give your rating report. And then treat that patient as if they do have that bacterial infection and get them to the correct and right receiving facility so that they can treat that. So if this is a child, um, we want to make sure that we take them to the facility that has the physician that's familiar with their situation. So if this child has a physician at Children's Hospital, that's going to be the best place for him to go. They know about him. They know his history. They know his disease process. They know what's normal for him. And, and we don't know that. So that's a good place for him to go. These patients are also very high risk for stroke because if those red blood cells log jam in the brain, that acts exactly like a blood clot in the brain and it keeps the oxygen from moving to the parts of the brain that are beyond that clot and causing part of the brain to die. So um, very high risk for strokes. Um, they're at high risk for heart attacks for the same reason. If that log jams in the heart, it acts like a blood clot in the heart and can give them a, a heart attack and cause part of that heart to die or to cause the patient to die. And also for bleeding in the brain, um, when you get that log jamming effect, those vessels in the brain are fairly small and um, they can cause weakening in the, in the cell walls. And so those small vessels can actually weaken and when it log jams, cause them to rupture and bleeding in the brain, which also is another form of a stroke. So we want to watch with these patients for seizures which can be indicative of the bleeding in the brain. Uh, we want to watch for altered mental status, which is indicative also of your two different types of stroke as well as your sepsis, um, and, and be at high risk. Now, I know when I read this, it's like, holy cow, you know, I, I would not be looking for stroke or heart attack symptoms in a two-year-old. Um, that just isn't the thing that I would even put on my list as possible diagnosis for this patient. But with sickle cell disease, we have to do that um, and not just look at, okay, this patient's over 50, so we need to look at heart attack and stroke. Um, this patient has sickle cell disease. Even if he's one or two, we have to be thinking about these things with those patients. Okay? So... I'm sure you feel smart already, and I really thought this was kind of a clever little slide. So, um, questions so far? Um, we're going to have you now complete your session one quiz. 
Again, you have to get an 85% on three attempts to move on to the next session. And then you can watch lecture for session two. When you get done with your quiz, you're halfway done with this course. Have a great quiz, and we'll see you very shortly.